Welcome back, everyone, to the DevOps track here at PyCon Online 2021. I hope you're enjoying the day and all of the talks that we've had available for you. I've certainly been enjoying this. It's been been fascinating. It's always interesting seeing how things come together. As, as we, you know, All this planning that we've done, you don't quite know how it's going to work out until we're actually live, but it's excellent when we see it happens. And so far, we haven't had anything fall over dramatically. Um, so there's still time. Hopefully we can break something really, really badly by the end of the day. It is the DevOps track after all. But here to uh, give us our next talk, we have Matthew Coles, who's here to talk about when a little web app needs to grow up, a journey from a hobby project to production. I'm keen to find out what this project was and hear about this journey. And uh, we have a prearranged signal to make sure that Matthew can come in at the right time. So Matthew, caca, caca, <laughs> over to you. Perfect. Uh, read loud and clear. So um, yeah, like thanks everyone for joining um, PyCon. My name's Matthew Coles. Um, I'm working in cloud at the moment. So I work for one of the, the cloud technology companies, um, but I've always been building apps. Um, a lot of the apps that I built are kind of like hobby projects, weekend projects, um, as well as like the ones that we, we have for work as well. So this, this story is really about a hobby project that turned into something a bit more. Um, hence the name and some of the learnings that I had with that. And and uh, I guess, you know, one of the most interesting things is like, how do these things grow? Like, and and how should you start? Because it is quite scary, um, you know, thinking about building something from scratch and all the different things. So anyways, um, considering we're on the DevOps track, the only other thing that I'll call out very quickly is uh, I, uh, I have yet, I just moved into a new space and I've got like a whole bunch of stuff half built in the background. Um, so I didn't manage to finish everything in my new little working from home area. Um, so hopefully that happens next week. But yeah, uh, let's get straight into it. So this uh, project that I wanted to talk about, I started with like something that a friend came and uh, chatted to me about. They said they were doing an event. Um, they wanted to be able to have uh, some T-shirts that were um, able to be delivered uh, to people that were attending the event. And the, the issue that they had was they, they didn't really trust uh, any of the third parties that had like quick, easy form systems or form solutions that they could use. The other thing is, uh, you know, like uh, my friend, she was very security conscious as well. And so she didn't really want to store much data when it came to the T-shirts as well. She just wanted a form that would basically send off uh, to a vendor. And so with that, I said, yeah, no problems. I'll treat it like a weekend project. And you can see a shot of my Lego on the side. Um, if I'm not working on side projects on the weekend, I'm usually building Lego. So this is one of the sets that I built uh, from, I think it was the creators, uh, Lego creators. So um, you can take a look at that there. So I sketched out a rough architecture of what I thought would be needed for this application based on those specifications that she provided. You know, I knew that I would be uh, creating some form of web application. It's probably going to be delivered out on a server. Um, it's going to have a whole bunch of different form elements. I'm probably going to need to know like the person's uh, name, their address, their phone number, uh, you know, what type of t-shirt that they want, what's the size, what's the color. Um, I might have some different details in some of the graphics as well. And, you know, this, this design was, was simply around, like, let's not have a database or anything. Let's just, like, take exactly what's entered in that form and feed it into an email service. And that email service is going to then notify the end user, like, the order's been submitted to, that, uh, to the vendor that's handling the T-shirt orders. Uh, but it's also going to, at the same time, on that same thread, also kind of act as the catalyst for the vendor to put that order together and ship it out to the customer. So it's fairly simple. But knowing me and the way that I work, and I think a lot of other people work this way as well, uh, I kind of want all the things when I build an app. So this is kind of like, you know, why, why I wanted to, to talk about this as a topic. But, you know, like I, I could have like massively like um, over, over scoped this, I guess. I'm always wanting to learn certain things. I always have a, like a backlog of things that I want to learn. I always want it to be a really cool, amazing app. And, um, you know, like that, that kind of got me thinking on this weekend before I started the project. Like, how do I, should I have users log in? Is that really needed? How do I handle logging? Should it be container-based? Should I use Docker or Kubernetes or something? Um, how am I going to handle like form validation? Um, like I can have simple validation on certain elements that are getting sent to me, but do we need additional validations to 
uh, make sure that user uh, email address is really an email and uh, a valid email address rather than just being entered as an email address. Um, are we going to have to track orders and give updates to customers? Like, can I make this nice and slick so I can just like uh, do a, a Git push, have it arrive in my Git repository, and then CI/CD does all the things and builds the environment magically for me, uh, which is nice. And then the other thing is like, you know, I, I spend a bit of time with React. Um, I really wanted to build a, a lot of this in Flask. I thought Flask would be a really nice framework uh, to use. And, and I really like um, using Python as a language. But I'm like, you know, do I need to have like a very slick front end? Should I be doing React and JavaScript at the very start? And the last thing is like messaging queues as well. So I send off an order and then it might be action by a system. Eventually I might have a database. Maybe I need Redis for state if I have users log in and maybe I use it for a couple of other things as well. Um, do I need an authentication server? Uh, do I need monitoring and alarming if something goes wrong? Like how many times is this going to be used? How, how often am I going to have to actually monitor this uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the orders coming in and making sure that it's up and available for everyone all the time? Uh, you can see on the other side as well, um, I was also thinking about, um, you know, the customer tracking uh, notification. So um, it's not just the, the order tracking, but it's like, how do I keep the customer completely updated on the life cycle of like the t-shirt being produced and everything else? So um, this is kind of like the, the default way that I work. And it's very different to what was actually needed for the project. And because it was a weekend project, I kind of made that final call to escape uh, dreamland. <laughs> so get, get my head out of the, the clouds in the sky and just simply focus on what was actually needed uh, to be delivered. And uh, it, it takes a lot of energy and patience from me to do that. And, uh, and, and we got there eventually, right? So I just really needed to get started. So yeah, I went back to my favorite tools, as I mentioned beforehand, Python and Flask. And I started to work to build the app over the weekend. So easy, done and dusted. I've made what I designed, very simple. It all works um, end to end very, very nicely. Um, you know, like it was just one simple event, one simple use case. I can basically park it now. But no, <laughs> that didn't happen in the end. About two months later, I had a couple of new people, other friends that wanted to leverage this um, solution from me as well. Um, they reached out and the original friend, she wanted uh, to use it for another event as well. So I guess what that meant was that I needed to make a few changes. And this is kind of like the purpose of the talk as well, right? Like if I'd, if I'd overcomplicated things and built what I thought was needed at the very start, the app would be very different to what it is today. And I'll, I'll show you the differences at the very end, um, but I wanted to talk to some of the complexities of, um, of the solution that I built as well. So you can kind of see the, the journey that I went on and the complexities and, and how I kind of came out the other end with quite a different architecture and quite a different application than I thought. And that's just all built through that muscle of experience. So I'm really happy that I, I started with a, a basic concept and then I basically added and iterated through that um, at each stage that um, something needed to happen and the project needed to grow or the app needed to grow as well. So the new request that came in was they had a couple of new items, uh, very similar to t-shirts. I think they were tracksuit pants uh, by memory. So my friend, she wanted to have tracksuit pants this time around. Uh, the other thing was uh, the other friend that came to me two months later as well. So this is two people. Uh, she wanted to use it for different orders. So she she was she had a different vendor and um, a slightly different thing. I think it was a hoodie, if I remember correctly. Um, but she wasn't going to use that same vendor. And what that effectively meant was uh, rather than having like a list emailed to one vendor, I now had uh, multiple vendors that I had to uh, bring in and support with my application. But those vendors also had different ways of working. Like the first one was very, very flexible and could just send on demand, um, you know, just in time delivery, I guess. The other one uh, was really focused on having like a full list of all the orders that were needed for all the customers and like, at a certain time in the uh, before the event, um, that company would then ship everything all at once. And so they kind of wanted everything presented in line items. So that kind of got me thinking about the architecture again. And I, I kind of realized in some cases, uh, I am actually going to have to introduce a database. Um, 
and think about the security and privacy of this as well. I, I don't really like handling usernames, addresses, um, phone numbers, and all of that. Um, so, you know, I, I was very careful on what I thought about in the security and privacy uh, realm of things. Um, but, but introducing this database as well, um, you know, I, I ended up creating like, I think an events table um, to manage like a, the couple of events that were coming in, but I was still manually like almost like creating a, a, a um, like a every single event, like I, I was starting to as more ask came in, I had this like structured um, like event uh, item type <laughs> is how I'd refer to it. So it's like, um, you know, this event has t-shirts, um, t-shirts have sizings and they have types, but, um, you know, like, uh, hoodies, uh, might be, uh, unisex. So you don't really need to know the type. It's all going to be the one, um, but it still needs the item size. And so that kind of like made me think a little bit more about, do I need more flexibility? Should I be using SQL or should I, uh, move across to NoSQL? Um, because I can have things as like a JSON string and maybe an object and I don't have to, it means that I'll be more flexible if we start offering more than t-shirts. So it was kind of like my thought process here. Um, and I'm really happy that I did that in the end, uh, because new items and more vendors came. So we, we had, uh, we had breakfast getting delivered, um, was one of the use cases my friends said they wanted to send, um, you know, a, a bunch of friends for a particular event. Uh, breakfast on the house and we have breakfast delivered across Melbourne um, using the application which is really cool um, we had those hoodie cases we had t-shirts as well we had socks we had uh, I couldn't find a emoji for Rubik's Cube maybe that will come someday uh, down in the future um, so I've got an ice cube here but we were like sending off Rubik's Cubes and pens and just a whole bunch of other stuff and so if I go back one I'm really happy that uh, I chose to go the NoSQL route um, you know, it would have been perfectly fine for SQL. There's ways of working this into SQL. Um, but, you know, like uh, this is a project in my side time and it was really good to just have a JSON object that I could interpret and uh, and show the different elements that customers might need to put to the order list. Um, so it kind of made my life a little bit simpler um, for the side project, uh, which is, yeah, which is really good. I ended up creating that vendor table because I realized we've got multiple vendors here and I had that flexible solution of like uh, using the database versus just sending an email, depending on like um, the preference of the vendor. And I had that design in the table as well. The other thing that I had to start thinking about was like the event hooks, right? Like um, when, when does the event close? When should I send the order data to the vendor um, and the customers? Like, when am I going to clear the data out? Because I don't really like to store this type of information long term, right? So I want I want it all gone um, once the event's gone. Um, but you also need a little bit, um, you, need, you need to keep it for a little bit of time as well, because sometimes um, customers need to change the order. Uh, sometimes the uh, vendor might lose the order as well. So I had to think about timing around all these things um, also, which was quite interesting. So you can see I'm like learning a lot from, uh, what I originally thought the ultimate version of this could be. Um, it's kind of, it's already branched off to something that's a bit more unexpected as I kind of get domain uh, knowledge of how these things work. Um, and then the other thing was um, I was still updating a lot of code for each of the different events. So every time a new event needed to be created, um, I would be like creating a route for that event. So you could have slash the event name. Um, I was um, I was kind of like rebuilding the application as well, redeploying the application. So, you know, there was a bit of manual love that I'd need to do there. In some events, they wanted uh, like a quick image hosted or they wanted a, a detailed description versus no description, no images. Um, they might have wanted different colors in the background and all of that. So things were kind of changing quite rapidly. The next thing was that that kind of took me into branding and allowing others to manage events because this was a hobby project. Uh, this was just a side project and this was for fun and this was to help a whole bunch of friends that suddenly needed use cases for this as well so they could send things everywhere. And so I, I started to think maybe it's time that I have a administration portal or a form builder. And, and those things are complicated beasts, I tell you. Um, you know, I, I I wanted to not have to um, manually change the code with the routes each time. So I, I started to try and like clone the app 
and have it deploy with a subdomain to make my life easier. So I looked at some of the cloud solutions in that space um, to make things quite easy for me, where like if, it, if, I, um, if I simply made a request, I could set up a new subdomain and, and have the app deploy and then have the data that's relevant to that particular program. Um, some of my friends wanted codes as well. So if anyone found that page, like there could be a unique code that was entered to say, hey, I am part of this event. So they didn't want authentication as such, but like um, this redemption code that could be used. So I ended up having like a code table uh, to manage this as well. Um, you know, on the admin portal and the form builder side, I needed some authentication. I needed the people that were building the events that I'd, I'd say, go, yeah, create your event here. They'd have to log in. And I wanted them to be managed. It was too... I didn't really want to do this for end users uh, because I thought authentication is a bit heavy. Like no one's really going to use my app twice, right? Like they're just going to go to a particular event, put in their details and then, you know, have a product shipped to them. So I, I didn't really put authentication on the end user side, but I thought, you know, my, my main friend, she's been using it multiple times. I've got other friends that want to use it like multiple times. That's where I kind of started to look at that admin portal. The form builder was a real headache, actually. I ended up like having a little bit of React here, but most of it was made in Python. And um, what I essentially was doing was like I was uh, I was saving to the database this JSON object, like so they could add, remove fields, and then like there would become a point where um, you know they've built exactly what they want, and that will save the JSON in the database. And then um, what I can have is I can have my application deploy. And, um, and I can have uh, those fields um, shown for that particular event, um, you know, based on what they've built out. So that, that was really complicated to, to work through. That took me a couple of weeks to, to kind of like look at and um, find a solution there and leverage a couple of different open source things, if I remember correctly. Um, and then the other thing was I wanted more automated deployments. So I'd started to look into like when I submit code, um, could I have multiple branches? Could I have that enact CI, CD to do the builds? Can I have some uh, some level of control over um, doing the builds, issuing like SSL certificates for each of the different URLs, creating like the URLs and the routes for the URLs and all of that? So I kind of got into the deep end with all this stuff. Uh, the last thing was uh, rather than having everything served through the Flask web application, including images and stuff, I started to think about moving it to like object storage or hosting. So I looked at my my uh, the cloud solutions around that. And um, I started to um, host the images there because that kind of took a little bit of the headache around um, uploading off of my hands and somebody else could worry about that. If anyone's done like, uh, you know, image hosting or this and that, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a very, it's a very big pain to implement securely. So I usually pass it on to uh, the hosting provider to have some kind of hosting, um, you know, object storage solution there. Now, just going to make sure I'm on time. Yep, perfect. Now, the next thing was the cost was erratic, right? Like I would have the server that was running all the time or, or set of servers and like I'd have them running for the whole event, but I might only get like a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand orders over a period of like a month um, leading up to each of these events before the merch was sent. And, um, you know, I was paying out of my own personal pocket for this. This was all for friends and, you know, got a, it got very um, expensive having multiple servers, um, you know, mocked up and running for about um, a month each. And, you know, my cloud bill was going up to about you know, a couple of hundred bucks, which is not ideal when it's out of my pocket. And so that kind of got me rethinking, like, what am I going to do here, right? Like, uh Am I going to am I going to have a look at like uh, having a containerized solution um, and having very small um, containers launch and then like um, scaling them up if I need to? I couldn't really work out a way of effectively um, pausing these containers. Um, like one of the challenges that I had in the space was like. Um, I don't want the user to have to wait for a server to relaunch for you know a, a minute before the URL loads for them. If if like I haven't had much activity for like four or five uh, hours on the ordering system, um, and it was still cost with all the different services that are the, all the different servers that I was spinning up. So that kind of led me down the serverless route, and I thought serverless is actually a pretty good solution um, for this application. Um, serverless solutions are kind of ephemeral. Like they launch very quickly, um, they do a particular task, and then they kind of go back to sleep until somebody comes back, right? So I thought, well, what I could do is I could use a, a, a CDN, a content delivery network. I could have my images stored 
um, within my object storage, my object hosting. And then what I could do is I could just write um, small snippets of code to basically like enact what I want to do with the data and check what's in the database and send notifications and this and that. And um, so I felt like it was a pretty good fit for serverless. Plus, I'd wanted to play with it, to be honest, as well, and learn a bit more. Um, I say Flask serverless here. Um, it wasn't actually Flask. Um, I, I used something very similar. I found a framework um, in particular um, that was built for a particular cloud vendor. So I, I ended up using that solution. Um, and that worked really, really nicely for me. Uh, it meant that I could tie into like their object storage quite easily, the database storage quite easily with minimal work. And to kind of move from like that existing um, Flask application to Flask, uh, to the serverless um, application, it was actually kind of minimal effort, right? Like, because I basically just copy pasted the routes and set up separate files and um, kind of separated things a, a little bit and reworked a little bit of the, uh, the logic. It was a lot quicker than I'd thought. Um, I'd, I'd probably I'd probably go down the container route if I had something really heavy that was always accessed, um, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, so I always found that interesting too. Um, you know, like you, you, there's always a point where it's like, is this a serverless use case? Is this a containers use case? Or should I keep my like existing app running as is and deploy, you know, like it, it in one go as one thing, um, which I might do if I've, you know, if I, uh, if I need to maintain state and I've kind of baked it into my app for some silly reason, sometimes, you know, it happens. Um, so I went down that route. And the other thing was like, I had a couple of users kind of say that they they had uh, lost their order or they um, or they don't think the form worked for whatever reason. Uh, and so I kind of started to think I might need to do some logging here. Um, I might want to have like some alarming, like based on certain events as well. Um, I might want some alarm set up if the bill starts getting too expensive and I haven't realized I've done something in particular and that's eating up cost. Um, but most of the alarm was there to make sure that like um, things were scaling up and things were deploying and things were working as expected. And then I also like just for fun because I wanted to learn as well. Um, but I also wanted like um, to not just like deploy the app each time in CI/CD. I, I wanted to kind of create these as like many many little applications. So they talk to the same central database. They'd be storing things in the same bucket. Um, but I started to think about how do I create like a whole bunch of like infrastructure around um, so that I could recreate the whole environment through code um, very, very quickly. So I looked at like some of the tools in that space, which is really cool too. Um, I also started to, and um, this is like something that uh, was, was in the works and I actually hadn't finished off because I haven't used uh, the application for a little while now. But I started to think about like not just having like email as a notification service um, from my cloud provider. I was using like a, a tool that they had for that there. Um, I started to think about like, do I introduce SMS as well? And that might help with um, the customer you know, in these bulk orders where they might submit at the very start of the month, the order doesn't get processed to the end of the month. At least they can see their journey um, with that with that vendor. It's like, hey, um, if the vendor's able to expose like updates on my side, I could translate them was what I was thinking. And I could basically have, uh, let's say, let's say uh, the order is starting to get processed. The order is now in manufacturing the order has been shipped and then you get shipping updates until it arrives at your doorstep. So I kind of thought that would be a really cool experience and SMS doesn't cost that much as well. Um, so it wouldn't be free, but I thought that would just like make the app more friendly for end users to use, even though I'm running it out of my own pocket. Um, so that's, that's kind of like uh, where we ended up. Right. Um, and this is kind of where we are today. So I wanted to kind of do a comparison, right? Like if, if I'd started with my perfect architecture, my perfect application, the perfect way of building things based on my head, I wasn't really a domain um, level expert in the space. Um, I, I would have ended up with a very different, um, you know, uh, product at the end of the day. So I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have realized like I needed more flexibility in my tables. I wouldn't, I, I would have realized that I probably didn't actually need to use Redis because I wasn't really maintaining like authentication or state from end users. Um, I was simply just like creating the order and then having things handled from there. Um, you know, I wanted to to kind of go down the container route, but I realized that serverless was going to be cheaper for this use case. Um, you can see how different the two solutions are when you kind of compare the, the really basic architectural diagrams that I've got here. So this, this kind of comes to, I, I guess, my learnings and the summary itself. Um, 
So, you know, essentially, like just to recap for everyone, it was a weekend hobby project. Um, I could have massively overcomplicated it just, just, as you just saw. Projects kind of, I, I guess this is probably the key learning that I had or the key thing in summary, is projects take on their own life um, as they get used in real life. And so it kind of made me second think about trying to lock things in um, at the end of the day and kind of setting out, this is exactly what the app's going to be. This is how it's going to grow up. Um, like, this is how I'm going to productionize things. Because I, th I think all of that stuff adds adds weight to me getting started, right? Like, I, I have to... I have to think about all these things and then there's so much complexity and it's so overwhelming. It kind of delays you getting started, but it also can delay like once you've gotten started, like you being able to deliver something very quick and valuable for end users. Um, that's actually going to get used and you're going to get feedback from right um, now, as you can see, I, I kind of use some of my own photos uh, in the deck, um, but I've tried to use emojis for the rest just because I like to fully own everything that I've, uh, I've built here. Um, so you can see it's a recycle pattern, but my additional learnings, and it's really supposed to be like an ev evolutional loop, right? So it's it, it's like things things have a life cycle. Um, you have a development life cycle, you have a feature um, life cycle, you have a, a life cycle as you work through bugs. And I, I guess like I've just really learned to not over-engineer or over-architect, over-design things at the start, kind of just let them breathe, as I've said beforehand. Um, you know, the app is ever-changing and growing. It's never finished. It's okay. Um, you know, design or architect for what's exactly needed at the time and what people are asking for. Don't don't try and over-engineer everything from the start again. So uh, kind of the same point. And the other thing is like refactoring is like good, right? Like it's it's really nice to rework over the code that I've got and see it grow and, um, and see that growth um, at the different application stages. You know, like I can go back and I can see the original code that I had versus where it ended up. And it's kind of really satisfying to see that growth over time too. Um, so it's just a nice little thing that I found. So this is it. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of take you through um, one of the journeys that I'd had and shared some of the learnings um, that I discovered within that journey. I hope this was valuable uh, to, uh, to people. Um, hopefully it kind of gets you second thinking, um, you know, about um, making things too complex to get started with, just design for exactly what you need. Um, I, I think it's really, um, it's really, uh, it, it kind of, it, it really helps me kind of just get through that initial hump of like, this is so, it's such a complex beast, it's going to take me forever and actually get me hands on the tools and started to build. So that, that's kind of, that's kind of my main learning. So thanks everyone for, for watching. I can hover around for questions, but I might pass back to you, Justin. Well, we, we have a few questions that have popped up through the chat. So um, we, and we have a bit of time now. So uh, let's, let's ask and answer a few of them if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, let's go for it. Awesome. Um, so I, I'm going to cherry pick one in particular, which came in later, but how many hours went into this alleged side project? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was over a weekend to start, right? So we're talking about six or seven hours uh yeah. to do the base level and then i think it's turned into 200 hours maybe more <laughs> yeah so it's a part-time job now yeah basically yeah it's, it's a side it's a it's an after hours project that just like gets uh iterated on uh now and then yep right uh, another question um is did you make the di the architecture diagrams as you were going or is this something that you've done in developing the talk yeah, so I did the architecture diagrams in the talk. Um, so I, I built them um, just via PowerPoint. Uh, the, the reason kind of why I, I do that is because they're actually usually just sketches in my notebook, right? And they, I'm not very good at sketching. So um, I needed to clean up a lot of this stuff. And the other thing is I'm, I'm not too worried about like having a diagram as I produce things, right? I just want to get in there and build. So I need to understand what the use case is, document the use case in my notes, um, and then kind of like think about and explore solutions for that use case. And, and that's kind of what I'd walked through today. So I actually never really produce architecture diagrams until I need to walk someone else through something, right? <laughs> right. So did you like sketch them on, on a pad as you were working it out? Or is it, it really the architecture just kind of emerged as you were building it and then you've, you've yeah. made it pretty now? It's, it's, it's bits and pieces, right? So, um, you know, like I just put it in my notebook and if I need to sketch something out and document it, then I can look at it later and go, yeah, what am I going to do about this database? Okay. Um, I'll try to order these as well. Um, 
Is there any reason why you didn't con- consider Django once you realized you needed an admin portal and forms and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, good point. I had thought about Django. Um, I just like the freedom of working in Flask. I, th- I think it's just a personal preference. Um, I-, I-, I like to know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, Django is an awesome framework. Uh, and I-, I kind of, I guess I didn't expect it to grow the way that it did, right? Uh, I didn't really expect I'd ever need an admin portal, like, to be honest. And so I, I could have redesigned things to Django, but I thought I'll start simply just by building something with Flask because I can do that in the weekends. Right. Um, and last question, because uh, we're running up against time. Um, uh, last question for here, but there'll be more in the in the chat if people want to do that. So do hang out there and, and everyone else do ask some more questions uh, in the chat or in the hallway track. Um, What's involved in deploying Flask to a server environment? Ah, yeah. Um, so there's complexity in that. Uh, to, to, to kind of be exact, I was using Elastic Beanstalk. Um, I could have used like a product like LightSail or something like that if I wanted to as well. Um, so basically, like the, the advantage to using a solution like that is I can go, this is my code repository that I've loaded in from GitHub. Uh, these are the scripts that I need to run on the server to do the deploy. Uh, I'm using, uh, you know, uh, Gunicorn or G-Unicorn. Someone's going to pull me up on that um, to do the deployment. Um, so I, I, I kind of, I kind of go like um, GitHub to one of these really easy to use frameworks. Right. Well, with that, um, we're, we're up against time, so I will I will leave it there. But I'm sure people will have other things that they they want to ask you about. So do come and hang out in the chat. Uh, for everyone else, um, we have a break now uh, until, let me check my notes, until 4.15, if I've got the check on that correctly. Yes, that's right. So until 4.15 p.m., so you've got about a 45-minute break. Uh, good time just to stretch your legs, um, get away from the screen a bit, drink some water, you know, practice a bit of that self-care. And uh, we'll see you back here, uh, same place, same bat time, same bat channel, at 4.15 p.m. for a talk by... Uh, oops, hang on, I pressed the wrong key. Molly Rowe, Molly Rowe, uh, called Metrics for Good and Not for Evil, which I am particularly interested in. I love love me some metrics, and uh, you preferably for good and not for evil. So we'll see you back here in about 45 minutes. Uh, otherwise, hang out in the chat, and uh, we'll continue talking all things DevOps. See you soon.